Hello and welcome back to the Handstand Cast with me, Emmett Lewis, and my invisible co-host, Mikhail Christiansen. As we know, uh, Mikhail is still on his holidays at the Tada Tada Artist Retreat, or Till and Denise's Artist Habitat, having a good time in Turkey. And internet's just a bit too laggy for us to do our normal video call to do one of these, so I'll do one this week, and you will have Mikhail doing one next week. Awesome. Hopefully. A uh, bit of housekeeping, or is there any housekeeping? It's always this kind of thing, I was like, I need someone to ask me how I am, so how are you? At? Yeah, I'm doing pretty good, uh, as you guys probably know. If you're listening in, or if this is your first time, I got a dog last week, or last month. We have a dog anyway, he's epic. My dog is now gone from 5.5 kilos, and we got him to 8.2 kilos in about a month. He's going to be jacked. He's a Samoyed cross Bernese mountain dog. So hopefully he doesn't get as big as the burners normally get, but, you know, if he does, awesome. I look forward to uh, resting him. And, yeah, I don't know. I've seen small dogs do handstands, but I haven't seen big dogs do handstands. Uh, if we have any vets listening in who might be able to advise me on the safety of that, could you DM me on Instagram? Because I would like to train the dog to do this as he gets a bit older, but obviously if it's too big a dog... Uh, you know, obviously I'm not going to do that because, let's face it, dogs are cool and we don't want to hurt them. So are cats as well. I always wonder, do we have more cat or dog people out there in handstand land? Or do we have an equal spread? Or are you like me who is, uh, yeah, I like all of them. Anyway, so that's enough of my rambling. Or is it enough for the rambling? Uh, once again, DM me and tell me. So... I'm going to do a bit of a flexibility-focused episode. and I thought I would just give a... I'm just going to talk about our main flexibility positions. I'm going to give a... This is a bit off the top of my head, by the way, so I'm just going to... I'm going to give you some insights, some tips, some tricks, and some concepts to work with and to think about when you are doing your flexibility training or the positions, or just so you have something to think about. So, for me, I'd say almost the first position, or the simplest to think about, is the forward fold the pike and the hip hinge. They're all kind of in the same family in some ways, shape or form. And this was generally the first position that develops to a very nice degree for most people. And what we're looking at, or what we want to think about generally is when I look at this position, I'm looking at if I... How to describe it? If we look at the lumbar spine, the lumbar spine basically has three distinct hinges. It has the hinge at the thoracolumbar junction. It has the middle point hinge around L3 uh, or the kidneys. And it has the hinge, the sacral hinge. And then we have the actual pelvis coming over hinge. And what we're looking for in this is generally these hinges develop sequentially. And this is one of the keys to how we use the Jefferson curl to actually develop flexibilities. We're, we're training these hinges in a manner and when we're doing an articulation-based fold rather than like a linear fold, so linear fold is when the torso is fixed and you're trying to basically hip hinge, basically linear folding, versus a articulation fold where we are articulating and we're flexing the spine, we're flexing it and the spine extends. Uh, in this, we're looking at if there's a limitation in one of the hinges or that hinge doesn't work as smooth or doesn't flex as nice as it should, the one below it and the hip will not follow. So we're kind of looking at that if we go down and go, oh, someone is locked up at L3 or tracker lumbar joint T12, L1, that kind of thing. You generally won't find them develop a nice pike for quite some time because they're already kind of fixed there. So this is one of these things like getting these hinges smooth and articulating nicely can be a very good way of freeing up the pike. One of the coolest ways to do this is actually, if we think of the motion of a Jefferson curl, if you don't know what a Jefferson curl is, check out my YouTube. We'll have the link in the show notes. I had what well, I guess I think it was the very first video tutorial on the internet of the Jefferson curl many years ago. Anyway, uh, if you were to take the same idea of the Jefferson curl, but do a wall squat, I'm sure you've all been tortured in PE by some sports coach going, do your wall squats and blah, blah, blah. Do that with your legs slightly high. So do them, you know, knees bent at 60 degrees, not 90 degrees. And then articulate down and use the wall to give this idea of the spine elongating in the vertical direction. So the spine gets longer, length against its length, 
and then rolls over. And then you can find the bits of your spine that aren't, don't articulate. We can focus on the lumbar for developing our pike. Or we can do the whole spine, obviously. And we find the bit that doesn't articulate using the wall for feedback and then go back down. You could do this as a full range of motion from the back of the head all the way down. Or we can do it going, oh, this bit doesn't you know, pick the section that feels like it's kind of locked down and kind of iron it out by going backwards and forwards over it. Then retesting the forward folds can be one of these ways that if you find your hips don't roll over, getting the lumbar hinges to flex nicer first, then approaching it. So first tip for the pike, try that out. This will vary level to level. Next tip for the pike. One of the things with the pike is when, if we think about how the body likes to move or how it tends to move, we have this global extension pattern, which is extension, supination, and external rotation, or is it pronation, pronation, sorry, not supination. And we have supination, no, supination, external rotation, and extension are coupled together, and pronation, flexion, and internal rotation are coupled together. So these are, are sort of triplets in the around the body of the general kind of rotational based axial movement. Now, in the pike, because we're flexing the hip, one of the things that can actually help is to get the hips to roll over is as you go down, you think about externally rotating the legs inwards. Now, they won't go a lot and you don't want them to go massively in and you generally will not have... You know, we've got to think a lot of times it might be 10 to 15 degrees, which visually is tiny. But in terms of creating space and letting the hips actually flex better is uh, massive. So you can try this out. It's a very nice thing to try. You do your forward fold. You will put the hands on the floor, do a standing forward fold as easy as to feel this. And look at the way your knees go. Are they pointing slightly outwards or slightly forward and try turn them to face each other you could imagine if you stuck i don't know pencils pointing forward on your knees so instead of going parallel they are pointing towards each other and converging and try that and then do that like rotate this in five ten times with control and then try deepen your pike and see how you feel and focus on the hip coming over aspect and see what happens this can be one of the things that can be a there is always just a bit of a bias, I think, to a lot of our exercise, a lot of our exercises, and a lot of the way the queuing is done nowadays is biased towards external external rotation of the hips. You see this in squatting, you see this in booty training, you see this in yeah, everything is kind of external rotation for some reason. Whereas we want the ability to transition from internal to external. This is what gives us a lot of our power. So this idea of like, oh, I'm internally rotating while I'm flexing the hip can help a lot. Uh, so the next thing we're thinking about the pike is depending, the pike is one of these ones that it's depending on where you feel it, it can be very nice to try to stretch in that zone first. So the classic one, I feel the stretch in the back of my knees, stretch your calves first, then do your pike and see how it changes. Does the sensation in the calves change? Okay, you're on to win. We're always playing with sensation and stretches. Or do I go deeper? Oh, I go deeper immediately. Okay, awesome. Then you could not stretch your bike and just stretch your calves and focus on that to save some time if you're limited on time. Or if you're not limited on time, you know, you can do a bit of this and then ask yourself, where do I feel it again? Oh, I now get precise on this. Get really precise. Go like I feel it in my left hamstring in the middle of the hamstring. And I feel it on my right side in the piriformis. Uh, Something like that. Or wherever you do, it's always going to be different from person to person. Then you want to do a single leg hamstring stretch or a bent leg hamstring stretch. Something what hits that zone exactly on the left side. And then a piriformis stretch on the right side. And then try the pike again and see where it goes. This gives us a bit of precision and a way to choose accessory exercises to our main stretching exercises. So you give that a go and then you go, oh, where do I feel it now? Okay, I feel it here. I feel it there. Try this again. It's a fun way to explore your body and to get to understand the sensations it gives you and what happens when you do one or the other. And then it's also interesting because you go, oh, my calves are tight. The classic one, my calves are tight. And the better question is, 
in what circumstances do your calves give you a feeling of being tight? Because the feeling, range of motion, and feeling of tension and tightness are two separate things, though they're correlated quite tight likely, but it depends. So it's like, oh, my calves are tight in this position, but they're not in that. Oh, okay, cool. So just bear that in mind. And this idea of like, okay, I can be tight somewhere. I stretch it. Does it change the, is it a limitation in the position I'm doing? Because like I could stretch my calves, I'll go back and it feels the exact same in my pike and there's no change in depth. I was like, oh, maybe the sensation is there, but it's not the actual limitation in the stretch. And this will apply for anything. We could think in side splits. I feel it in my doctor Magnus on one side. I stretch that. I go back, I test my side split and I don't. When I say stretch that in these circumstances, the best way to do this is static, passive, relaxed stretches in a zone where you feel and can control the breathing. The next tip for our forward fold is what you're going to do is you're going to perform head tilts while in the forward fold. You're going to extend the neck up as far as you can with the eyes leading. Try to go all the way and look, try to look behind yourself while keeping down. You're going to tuck the chin to the chest and you're just going to rock these backwards and forwards 10, 15 times. I'd advise when you do this to not get too deep into the fold. So maybe 80% of where you're, so go in, take a note where you are, and then just come out a bit to 80%. and Do your tilts and then retest. See how that feels. This one, once again, a lot of things I'm giving this evening will just be, there can be things where you go, oh, oh my God, that was a game changer for me. And the next person will go, I tried that and I've done literally nothing and everything in between. So try all these things out and, you know, let's see what we can get out of them. Uh, yeah, so... That is our, some tips and some things to try that are non-conventional in the forward fold. The next one we are going to look at is, we, go, we will go with the bridge. So in the bridge, there's, sorry, I'm struggling for words here. Uh, a bit tired, I've got a bit of dog brain on, I'm getting up at night and not sleeping too well to let the dog in and out to pee. Eventually, his bladder will get big enough to store up his pee, but, you know, whatever. Uh, anyway, dog brain aside, in the bridge, generally, once I always say is the bridge is a position that is a compound position. You train all the bits of it in separate positions, then you put it together. So we train our hip extension in one direction. We train our thoracic spine extension, our spine extension in general. And we train our shoulder flexion in another position. Then we put it all together and we go, voila, you have a bridge. But there's some of the specific limitations in the bridge can only be really addressed in the bridge itself. Uh, one of these very interesting ones is the liver. And oddly enough, the liver can be quite a strong limitation because it attaches close to the diaphragm. And the diaphragm, if it's limited, will stop the spine extending, basically. So one of the things you can do, and... This is, once again, this is one of these hacks. These are flexibility cheat codes, we'll call them. We're not going to call it a hack because that sounds bad. It's a flexibility cheat code. And what a flexibility cheat code is, like a cheat code in a video game, it allows the game to be easier. It doesn't mean you, can't, you don't have to play the game. You still have to play the game to finish it, but it makes it a bit easier. So this is what we're doing this evening, flexibility cheat codes. Cool. That will be the title of the episode, by the way. You can tell I'm ad-libbing this. So the liver can be our limitation in our bridge. So what I'd like you to do on this one is once again, get warmed up, get ready to do a bridge. Do your bridge. Test it out. Get down, lie down on your back and locate your liver, which is on the right side, just underneath the ribs. Get your fingers. I want you to squish all the way from your lateral side towards the middle. You're just going to squish it up and down like a pump. The squish, squish, squish. You can be quite forceful in this. It can take a bit of a beating. It's fine. But start gentle. See how your tolerance goes. If it hurts a lot, you know, these things shouldn't really hurt a lot. It should be unpleasant to a certain degree. Once you get used to it, it's generally fine. But pain, maybe don't do it or maybe have your liver checked out. Definitely always these things are maybe stop the partying or start partying harder. Anyway, so you're going to pump the liver up and down with your fingers. You're going to work away all its length. Get a picture off Wikipedia or something where it might be. And, you know, 
The advice I have on this is basically try to touch your back through your front. Do this for about five, six minutes. Pump in the litter or even just two minutes, even 30 seconds can work if it's a limitation. And then get back into your bridge and see how it feels. This is one, once again, one of those things that could be awesome. It can be a big change or not. Uh, but give it a go. The next hack, or no, sorry, I banned myself on saying hack. Next cheat code we're going to look at for the bridge is the sternal fascial bridge. So as you're probably aware, we have this bone in the center, bone cartilage kind of thing in the center of the rib cage. And it's, if we think about the pecs and all the other stuff and all the muscles we use to hug people and do our bench press and push-ups and stuff like this, they join side to side across this kind of bony thing with this kind of fascial area. And it's connective tissue. And one of the nice things about connective tissue is it can get very strong, acute effects to your training that make things feel much better by pressing on it. So what you're going to do in this thing is you're going to find the notch at the bottom of your neck and you're going to just get your knuckle. You have to be kind of almost unpleasantly hard. You might want to, if you're hairy, you might want to grease it up a bit. And you're going to rub your knuckle down like you're trying to leave a big red mark in the middle of the chest all the way down to the sternum. You do that three or four times is generally enough, you know, 10 times just to make sure it's working. Give it a good, like, good kind of hard scrape down with your knuckle and then test your bridge and see what happens. This one you might want to record on video because generally you'll just go deeper in the bridge and you won't get too much of a change in sensation. But if you look at the video, you'll go, oh, wait, that was really good. I remember we'd done this one at the retreat and we've done this one coupled with a couple of other bits and pieces and warm up and everything. And I think every single person in the room done the deepest bridge of their life in that one session. So and it definitely helped. And even like some of the more, some of our more crazy backbenders done it. Uh, is it a permanent effect? No, it's a cheat code. Just like when you play a video game, you have to put the cheat code in every time. It doesn't save. So try that one out. Now, where are we at? Next. The next one to try out for the bridge, which is kind of an interesting one if you find it's hard to get the shoulders open or the chest open, is the biceps. And in particular, you want to get this area, which is about four fingers, basically four fingers up and on the inside of the bicep. You feel it in uh, from the elbow, four fingers up from the elbow, sorry. And you're going to go in and you're just going to hold constant pressure in there for 90 seconds. Now, if you need it and you press in here, like press quite hard. You should be able to press quite hard and it should be, it shouldn't hurt. If it hurts, I'm going to say you probably need it and hold it down. Hold the pressure down. I just use my three fingers. You could, if you have a floss band or you know the wood, you could put it on quite tight there. If you're feeling brave, you could ask someone to kneel on it. This is uh, definitely one of these things you could do, but, you know, start gentle and then test the bridge again. See how it changes. Note, is it good for me? Does it change? Is it nice? Okay. Yes, no, maybe. Give it a go and find out. So, I think next we will look at our friend, the pancake. And one of the interesting things of the pancake is there's kind of this weird spot where I feel a lot of people kind of get stuck on their pancake, where they can lean forward, but you can't get enough pressure forward to do anything effectively. And we have this kind of rule. It's like, first we go down in the pancake, then we go side to side. So what we mean by this is pancake generally trains standing for quite some time until you can get what looks like a good pancake when you take a photo and flip it 90 degrees. Once you get that, then you'll go, okay, cool. Let's go sit on the floor. You'll sit on the floor and you go, oh, it's nothing's happening. I can, you know, it feels like you're there, but you're, you haven't got enough thing or maybe your torso is not heavy enough. Whatever. What we can do is going sideways and we'll use side bending. So you'll either do an exercise going in or out. You'll do a static hold. You'll do a stretch or a partner stretch. So you'll stretch your sides first and then go forwards. And this is one of those things that can get over a lot of 
can you get past that point to the point where you sit on the floor and you go, okay, now when I go forward, it feels like I'm actually achieving something. That's what we're looking for. It can also just help get the hips to start rolling over because it's one of these things we you see this a lot in pancakes and it kind of annoys me slightly is that it's, you know, keep the back perfectly extended and then expect your hips to flex. And it's this kind of thing of like, oh, why do we have the spine extended when we are deadlifting? Because we want to extend the hips. What are we trying to do when we're a pancake? We're trying to flex the hips. So think about this as an idea that like, maybe we want the head to flex. The head, head leads the spine, spine leads the hips. Very simple. So maybe we want the neck to flex slightly, not a lot. And we want the spine to flex and that gets us down. And then as we get better, that will get the hips to roll over and then we can straighten out the spine. So just bear that in mind if you're kind of limited in your pancake and you're trying to keep your back perfectly straight. It's kind of one of those things that you know trapped me in a lot of my coaching for years. Like I, I told everyone all this, like, I don't know, seven, eight years ago. I was like, always keep the spine perfectly flat when you pancake. And this is me who had an okay pancake and then also learned off people who had God tier pancakes. And you're just like, oh, this is, this is it. I can do it like this because I'm super flexible. So you must have to do it like this. So like, no, no, no. We use the natural motions of the body. We get the pancake and then we make it look nice and make it the how we want. We also have to think like there is this onus to probably like get this neutral spine in a pancake or even extended spine in a pancake. But if we really think about it, like in hand balance, like what are we doing with our spine? And generally it's also like the general advice is to keep the ribs sunk and the, the spine open or flexed or neutral but not really super neutral, and the posterior tilted pelvis. So there's generally a straight spine in a lot of cases. What do we do want to do when we're pressing? We're going from a curved spine to a basically less curved spine. We're not trying to press with a fully extended spine. You could do that, I suppose, but it's not really what we're looking for. We're looking to articulate up on top of it. So there is this case just to focus on pancake like that. Uh, so just bear this in mind. Uh, other stuff if you sit on the floor and you're doing a pancake and you cannot lift your legs off the ground in a compression then let's face it you need to work on your compression before it's one of the key tests like if you can't lift your legs off the ground even just once in the thing you're weak in compression and training compression will probably get your pancake moving faster than stretching your pancake so always bear that in mind. Uh, where to next? We will do some tips and hints for front splits. So the front split is, once again, it's one of these compound positions that we get the hip extension by training some stuff separately. We get the hamstring flexibility by training some other stuff separately. Then we put them together. In the front split generally what we're looking for is depending on this is where bony limited the front split is always a bit more unique than everything else i find there's always kind of a bit of variance on this that generally when you do it your limitations of your hip extensions will dictate the shape of your front split so generally what i mean by your limitations what your bone capsule is allowed to do so some people have a let's just say rhythmic gymnasts, obviously aside people have trained for a very long time, generally will warp the bone capsules a bit and show higher than normal. But generally you have about 50 degrees of hip extension as a kind of bell curve max with obviously some outliers on either side of that. And generally about tw- doing 20, 25 and 45 degrees hip extension based on the joint capsule alone. So it's different on each one. Then if we want to get a flat front split, Depending on the amount of muscle you have, the more muscle you have, the less flexing you need to be because the ties and the back of the ties and the front of them will touch the ground before and then you'll be like, oh, I'm down. And the thinner you are, the more flexing you need to get a straight looking split. So bear that in mind. But if we were to max out our potential and we were just to say, for instance, 180 degrees between the bones is our front split, then we need the back leg to extend... 45 degrees let's say we have that and then that means to get our 180 degrees we need a 135 degrees of hamstring flexibility on the lead leg to actually get that so if we think about tilt 
we think about, oh, so 135 degrees is quite a big, it's quite a lot. So that's kind of what you're looking for. And this kind of anterior, basically anterior tilt, this anterior tilt means that if we look at someone who's upright and their chest is facing forwards to the front wall of the room, generally this will mean if you look at their lumbar spine, there will be a lot of extension. And what tricks people and stops people is if you're, uh, lumbar spine doesn't extend too well in these positions, or if you're just trying to keep neutral, you will have to be leaning forward in the front split. If we were to like, same thing, like get as many pictures of people as you want when they're doing this. And if you think about them setting up in a neutral or straight spine in their front split and use the angle that the sacrum is making, the sacrum or the pelvis is making, and just project a line in what direction they would be leaning it's very clarifying on what's actually really important in the front split, which is a shit ton of hamstring flexibility. And obviously back extension, extension of other stuff is important, but hamstring is generally the bigger limitation for a lot of people. So that's one of the things what we're looking for. So what this means also, when we're looking to develop flexibility, generally we want to close these active passive gaps. So a passive gap, an active passive gap is like, oh, I want my body to go one direction I need to be able to lift the leg and move the body in the other direction or simplify it. So if I want to be able to fold my hip past 90 degrees to 110, 120, 130 degrees, then I should be able to lift my leg up to this direction actively. So if you have trouble, and a lot of people do, holding the leg in an active straight leg, active leg raise at 90 degrees or above 90 degrees, then you basically have some work to do, more so than anything else. And uh, This is one of the things, this is one of the biggest limitations I've discovered in splits, side splits and pancake, is people's active leg raises are terrible, either going forward in a front split kind of configuration or out to the side in a kind of pancake side fit configuration, even just with one leg. People, we have the, we have the Modern Methods of Mobility Training Program, as some of you know, and if you don't, check it out, modernmethods.com. Uh, or modern methods of mobility.com. Anyway, uh, yeah, so we have this online coaching program where people get assessed. Uh, we have done, I don't know, probably about 200 assessments, 300 since it launched. And yeah, people are weak as shit in these positions. It's one of those ones like it's rare. Whenever we have someone who can actually do it, generally the only people who can do it are aerialists or pole dancers. Why? Because they use their legs a lot. And they're generally the more flexible people as well. But spending some time on these positions and active straight leg raises when you stand and lift your leg forward, straight up, pointing out. It's like a standing L sit, basically. And the other one, the abducted one, is out to the side. Just externally rotate your leg and whatever direction the toes point, lift it up that way. You want these to be like above 90 degrees. Why do I say 90 degrees? Because once the hip crosses 90 degrees, the rectus femoris is what is doing it. And once it crosses 90 degrees, iliacus and psoas take over. So we want these muscles to be mightily strong. And this is kind of a big limitation for people because when our hip is going down, and if we think about what we're doing in a lot of our stretching positions, we're actively pulling ourselves in or we're using the muscles to maintain the correct alignment we want to hit. So if we can't get these positions, then we need to train these separate and build the strength and then apply it in the position. So this is one of those ones, if you find your split turns out a lot, this could be one of the reasons, which leads to my next one, the turned out split, lateral hamstring, the outer hamstring is a big limitation, Uh, something I actually discovered on my, uh, uh, on the coaching, on the assessments and stuff as a bit of a blind spot because, yeah, we just don't really train with the hamstring crossing the body. And it was one of the things we had to put back into the training in a much more sustained focus. And one of the things I'd advise you to do it. And training the lateral hamstrings, because a lot of position views were bringing the legs out. One of the hamstrings is getting stretched more. The ductor magnus will get stretched more. The inner hamstring will get stretched more because the elongation direction is biased in handstands and training. If we think side splits, pancake, all this. But the lateral one is not getting it. So outer hamstring training, finding some positions or just... Even if you think about doing your forward folds on a single leg and training so the leg is coming up to the opposite shoulder, it's a game changer. It's one of those game changers. And it's one of those ones that it, it, the limitation is weird because it across, starts cropping up in strange places. 
where we were finding some people where there was a kind of common issue occurring in side splits where people were reporting the same kind of sensation base. It was like adductor magnus was taking a hit and there was kind of congestion around the knee, these kind of things. It described differently, but it was all pointing in the same zone. And we were obviously doing all our isometrics and all our other kind of stuff. But it wasn't really, it was, yeah, it just wasn't doing anything. So then we started screening people with the outer hamstring and the amount of people who we got the outer hamstring, stretched it in one session, and then the issue, the issue resolved when they'd done the stretching afterwards. It was like gone. Obviously, this wasn't permanent. We had to keep repeating it, like all these kind of things. There's, there's actually, there's a good rule of thumb here. If you find you have a limitation in something, you find something that makes it go away, then you have to keep repeating the thing that goes away and develop it. So let's say I stretch my calves for 40 seconds and that makes my pike feel better, like we talked about at the start. Then in the next one, I'm going to need to keep stretching my calves and then I'm also going to need to build up my time, endurance and possibly strength in this position to make it a permanent change. So we can use these short-term acute sensations to give us a longer-term change. But as a guide, then once again, how we pick our accessory exercises. Uh... Yeah, so back to front split. So, yeah, these are one of those things that are kind of interesting. The other interesting thing is the square hip front split. Now, how do you know if your hips are truly square in front split? It's simple. Take a picture from the side, and if you can see both butt cheeks, you're not square. There you go. Simple. If you can only see part of one butt cheek, you're almost there. Now, one of the interesting ways of... Getting your front split square is not to worry about squaring the hip, but is to pull the opposite shoulder back. So you might think about our archer or pullback position. So on the leg that is going backwards, that arm goes forward and pushes forward. On the other side, the left arm, so say left leg forward, the forward leg arm pulls backwards and the spine rotates backwards. And this will generate our squareness. And it's one of those nice ways to get it. It's one of the ways to think like there's always kind of what I say to people when you're trying to train for the square hip front split is say you're turned out 30 degrees. Well, you basically want almost 60 degrees of rotation through the torso to make the hip catch up and be square. So you always want to basically roughly rule of thumb is roughly double what you need for the hips to get square in the other one. So torso turns need 30 degrees to get more hip squareness, rotate 60 degrees with the torso, need 20 degrees, rotate 40 degrees. Rule of thumb, it's not a fixed number, but it definitely just gives you an idea of how much you have to turn because let's face it, the spine rotates as well. So by the time the spine is rotated and picked up all the rotation along all its length, that's when you'll need to, that's when the hip will start to follow. So just think about that. It's pulling the slack out of the system. Uh, where to next? Yeah, it's always these kind of things. We will do side splits. So in the side split, it's one of these things that it's basically, how do you define the side split? It's always one of the things I always find quite interesting. It's like different places have different ways of describing it. What I really think for what your true side split is, is when you go chest down on the floor, legs out to the side, whatever degree of external rotation your hips need to get there. And then what you're looking at is if you look at it from the side, that little pointy bone at the top of the hips should slightly be ahead of the thighs. That's the true side split for me. And that's your true the true measure of your side split because that's like, okay, the hips are going to be tilted what they need to be. Some of you, if you look at some people doing a split in this way, you'll see, you'll begin to get a feeling of how much hip tilt they need. Some people can keep the lumbar really flat and have almost looks like a posterior tilt. It's not, but it looks like it. And other people, if you look at the sacrum angle, the sacrum angle can, can be pointing quite aggressively down to the floor with the lumbar spine making up for it. So this will be basically down to your individual anatomy. But what we're looking for in this is, it's like, this is basically as flat as you're going to get. And this will give you the idea of like, okay, it's not going to tell you where your limitations are, but this is like your true side split, in my opinion. Uh, 
well, there's other ways of measuring it. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying it's the way, but this is one of the very ways, good ways for hand balance because this position will give you a very good idea of like, what is my flattest split handstand, straddle handstand going to look like? Uh, once we have that, then we can translate it into a position and work on the active ranges. And it's also, you know, it will give, yeah, it just gives a lot of information. So this is one way to measure it and one way that uh, looks nice. So if you train a lot of your side splits and you find your feet are pointing up or you're like sitting up or you're trying to keep the torso up, generally if we look at it from the side, you're generally sitting backwards. You're sitting down into it. That is okay. It's definitely one of the ways to train it. But this way, because you're not sitting back into it and that hip crease isn't over flex compared to the abduction, that gives you a good measure of like where is my true splide split and a good way to measure it. Um, so, yeah. So generally, the next kind of thing we want to look at in the side split is when I lie down, feet, lie down on my back, flex the lower spine, push the lumbar spine into the back, and then I can pull my legs apart. This position... This kind of one is one of our ways to identify like, oh, what is my, what's the best straddle handstand I could get? And this will give you a clue. And if you find like that your straddle handstand in this position, well, straddle handstand, your legs coming apart in this position is kind of a bit jank. And I see this even like, I see people in splits, like very good side splits who've trained it for whatever way, but they can't pull their legs down. Then these are the people I see who have a split in a handstand that is just quite high, quite narrow. So training this position, and if you find this is your kind of weak position, you find like the legs barely even come down. Generally, what you want to do is train it with weights. You want to use the old weights. You want to do lifts in and out. You could hold down. The key in this is you want to actively be pulling down as you get into the position. So I lower down. I let the weights pull me down. And then I try to basically pull my femurs into the socket and then make my butt cheeks touch at the back. So I'm trying to make them touch over the side of the sacrum as an image. This is really good. There's another nice way of training this where you can do it seated as well. And what you're going to do is get a band. You're going to loop a band around both your feet. Now, most of you will have seen this and tried this out. And what you want to do to really kickstart this or really get it going is you want to get a yoga block, possibly two yoga blocks, and put them. So you're doing a seated straddle. The legs are coming apart. You put the band around your feet, going around the back, and you put it around the back of the yoga blocks. And this will give that resistance you want. And it will also give you the idea that you can like actively pull the legs apart. It's definitely one of those ones to try. You can try it out lying as well if you want. It's definitely something that can be a bit weird on the lower back, depending on your size, but give it a go. But it's definitely an interesting thing to try out, an interesting novel stimulus. It's not the best. Once again, it's like everything in, I've kind of touched on this evening. For some of you, it will be the greatest thing you've ever felt in your split and the thing you're missing. For the rest of you, it'll be meh. But you try it out and you see what works. So there's a few flexibility kind of things to try out and to play with over the next while i have a few questions to get to on the topic of flexibility i have one what i have to say is the most australian question i've ever gotten so i'm going to read that one out first uh i'll do the one okay so this is a question uh shout out to marshall for this hi guys marshall here I'm a bus driver from Townsville, North Queensland, Australia. So we can already tell what's his problem going to be. He's gripping a steering wheel all day long. It's going to be something with wrist extension. I haven't read this question, but I can tell you that right now. Uh, I'm loving the podcast so far. I've been listening to it in the bus. Uh, it's taken me a little over a week to listen to all the episodes. Awesome. Awesome, Marshall. I'm glad you... Uh, always like, I'm always amazed that people like to listen to it. So I really am so happy that it's been taking so well. Uh, there has been so much relevant information for me. I started rock climbing about 10 years ago and uh, started yoga not long after. She did cover acro yoga about six years ago. Okay, we know Marshall is an active person. We know he rock climbs. So once again, we know wrists and fingers are going to be some kind of limitation for this guy. Uh, to do discover acro yoga. And yeah, if he's a bus driver, we can probably assume he's a big guy, so he's going to be a base as well. Uh, I'm now 
Qualified as a climbing guy, 200 hour yoga teacher and level one acro yoga teacher. Awesome. Uh, I organize acro jams in my local community. Even with my qualifications, I probably fall more into the category of enthusiastic amateur. Everyone who was listening to my podcast last week about community or last two weeks ago, enthusiastic amateurs is what we need. Like for a community to be really cool and everything is we need the enthusiastic amateurs. And once we have enough enthusiastic amateurs, that's when we get like the enthusiastic amateurs who are better than the professionals. So awesome that he's organizing this guy thing. Uh, the community here is quite small. And so I've collected people from lots of disciplines, gymnastics, cheerleading, breakdancing, etc. Awesome. Once again, share and share alike. Learn from cross-pollination of the arts. Boom. We love it. Uh, sometimes we even organize weekends with the groups in Cairns, the next big city, which is about a five-hour drive. Oh, yeah, I don't mean to brag about our COVID situation, but I'm heading to Acrobatics Convention this weekend. Once again, this is the most Australian question I've ever got. It's like so much detail that probably is irrelevant, but we're going to pick it apart. Uh, granted, it's much smaller because of COVID, and last year was run back-to-back with a circus convention as well. Cool. Uh, sorry, I'm rambling, but we'll probably ramble a little bit more before I get to my question. It's okay, we ramble a lot here. Uh, I figure this is okay, considering the way your podcast goes. Okay, we can tell he's been listening to the podcast. Uh, where am I? So anyway, I've become uh, quite obsessed with training handstands and splits, and maybe neglecting many of the other areas in my yoga practice. Uh, I did teach myself to pike press from standing before I had any real ability to hold a handstand for very long. Uh, but then I've been working a lot on basing, in locate, hand to hand with my flyer Marcello. Marcello comes from a breakdancing and parkour background and is a beast of planche. I can tell you now Marcello's handstand is probably not going to be good. However, he hasn't got the shoulder mobility. <laughs> uh, you could say he's perfected the banana handstand. I think I'm a little too good at this, maybe. Sorry, I'm bragging here, but uh, give me a give me a hint. I've been talking for 40 minutes. Uh, while he's working on his flexibility to try and work towards getting Federation approved, I have found all the leg work in lifting Marcello, who weighs about 7 kilo, has made my legs feel bulkier and harder to lift in press. So now I'm back to relearning press, this time refining technique, hopefully this time with straight arms. Cool. Uh, generally, yeah, it's one of those things like big legs are awesome. You can press with big legs. I've done it. You just need to basically, yeah. One of the tips I'd actually give for people who base is train. You can train relative strength without getting the volume in. So just getting really fucking strong in doubles, triples, that kind of thing, like deadlifts, this thing. I think everyone who's basing should be lifting weights to a certain degree. doesn't mean it should be the main course of your training, but two or three weight sessions focusing on like the big lifts getting them stronger, military press, squat, deadlift, these kind of things will go a long way to uh, ensuring a lot of success. Uh, okay, where are we? Finally, this leads to my question. My reactive wrist extension only goes to about 45 degrees, and when I put my hands on the ground, I can force my wrist to 90 degrees, much more than that, and my palm starts to lift. What did I say at the start of the question? Climber, we got wrist tightness. It's a thing. Uh, I feel like this is a limiting factor in getting the weight over my hand for pressing. Otherwise, I just have to bend my elbows. Yeah, this is kind of quite common. So let me read the rest of this before I give some answers here. I feel like this is my limiting factor in getting the weight over my hand for pressing. Otherwise, I just have to bend my elbows. I'm not sure if this could be caused by my bone structure. I have had quite good progress with my splits training by adding weight to the stretch. Intuitively, I feel like this is a bad idea from wrists. Is there a difference in the way you approach lengthening the muscles versus tendons, or more specifically, the wrist joint? Also, in the last few months of training splits, I've been getting quite loud cracks from my hips and sometimes runs down to the back of my knees. I guess it's just the tendons repositioning. There is no pain when it happens. I just want to kind of verify that it's not a warning sign. I could be doing something wrong. I look forward to hearing this discussion and to know if there are others out there with anything similar to me. First off, we can say when you start getting more flexible and working on splits and all this stuff, you do start getting joint noises. It happens. Things start cracking that weren't cracking before. It got noises. The general rule of thumb is as long as the crack is and the noise is without pain, it's generally fine. That's basically it. 
if you find like you have to force it and then there's a loud crack and it hurts afterwards, maybe you need to get checked out or maybe you need to look at some gaps in your training. But generally, yeah, there is a process you go through. Maybe it'll be a click that just sticks with you for life, but you'll have the flexibility or maybe not. But it's definitely something that's very, very common. Uh, Right, so the wrist issue. So the wrist issue. So one, it's kind of an interesting one because we have a lot of climbers who do handstands now or have started. There's definitely a notice of you listening to podcasts. Generally, we can look at climbing. It's like, oh, we have developed a lot of strength and a lot of integrity in the tendons and the hands in general. So we need a way to stretch them. Generally, we have this finger elevated stretch and it's kind of one of these things where we are doing these long held passive stretches to make the tendons and the intrinsic muscles of the hand and the parallel elastic components relax, essentially, to put a non-technical term. What I mean by this is they need a longer duration hold in a more quite extreme position to get going. So what I would recommend is these plank finger stretches. So this will be where you will put your fingers, you get a book, something two centimeters, three centimeters, not super high, and you raise your fingers up and you try to get your palms flat on the ground and you can start in a quadruped and then you can move to a plank like a push-up position and kind of hold it there. Generally, I want people to hold these for about 90 seconds. Now, this is kind of the opposite of what we would, if we were strength training for the tendons and all this, we'd want to be doing shorter, more intense stuff, all this. You do this in climbing anyway because we're doing short hold grip, short hold thing. We're also doing a handstands when we're weight shifts, recorrect. All this is kind of happening. This is kind of to do the opposite of that where we want things to open out and take some time. It's also one of those things with joint capsules. It takes a while for the collagen to start moving. It just takes a while. There's a few processes to go on there. So these kind of longer holds, 90 seconds, two minutes, are great in this. The next thing what we want to do is like, okay, our active wrist extension goes about 45 degrees. It's one of those things, like I know there is a few people from the FRC kind of school going like, if you can't extend the wrist 90 degrees, why are you doing handstands? Well, if you can't extend the wrist 90 degrees, why are you asking a person to get up and down from the floor where they have to load their wrist with 70 to 80% of their body weight? Is my retort to that. Uh, so how do you get down the floor? I'll just do a backwards roll, I suppose. Anyway, uh, what we're doing in this generally is we do, the limitation isn't fine because I remember when that actually came out, I done this and I asked Mikael actually done it as well separately and we went around all the most advanced balancers we could find and only a few of them, only the people who were really hypermobile could actually extend the rests, yet everyone could do one arms. So color read the proof is meh. Anyway, uh, we, but we do want to shore this up. One of the hidden gaps in wrist development is the reverse wrist curl. No one trains this movement. And it's one of those ones, like I know some of my students, they have to have it in their training all the time or else they get wrist issues if it drops off. So what you want to do is normal, like, you know, this is like 1970s bodybuilder shit. Get a barbell, get a dumbbell, and train for 12 to 15 reps with three to four sets of extending the rips, wrist. Getting these really nice, putting pauses on the top, actively holding them there. This is the other one. It's like actively hold them as hard as you can, pushing the wrist forward. Another nice one in this situation is active wrist extensions with the hand up overhead. So put your hand overhead like you would in a handstand, replicate the position as much as you can, and then actively pull back hard. This is going to be like, this is basically... The cramping you get in a hip compression, like you would in a pancake, you will get this in the forearm for this movement and deal with it. Uh, This will slowly start to get things moving. Now, we can deal with the press in a different way, though, because why should we limit the press technique? Well, there's ways to work around it. So if we want to work around our press technique, we could train the press on parallettes. This will remove the wrist limitation. You could also turn your hands out. So you could practice balancing your hands turned out about 45 degrees. See, this is very common in gymnastics. Um, You could do that. You could do, you know, maybe your balance won't be as good or take a while to get used to it. Maybe balance will be fine, but turning the hands out will be pretty good in this one. Even though some gymnasts turn the hands out almost 90 degrees when they're doing presses because it's just what they're used to. So there's this kind of thing that you can train the press, you can work on the wrist extension and flexibility separate, and then when they kind of catch up and work together, 
and you can put them back together. Very simple, very easy. Uh, cool. So I think we have... No, I got that one. Uh, pros are elbow health. Pros and cons of locking out the elbows versus microbend and which direction the eye, the elbow faces. Uh, generally, we're always going to tell people to lock the elbows. They're... There's no real pros and cons. Pros to locking the elbows is it makes the balance easier and there's less joints moving to absorb the balance. The pros of having a micro bend is they can work as a bit of shock absorber. You can correct your balance on them. Generally, at different stages of your handstand training, you should work on them. Beginners always lock the elbows. Intermediate, unlock the elbows, begin to balance there, do everything you can to maintain it. Advanced, talking about two arms, uh, always lock the elbows and let the balance come from the fingers. Simple, really. There's options. Do them, do them all, basically. Uh, once again, one arms is like we tell people to lock, but if you look at anyone balancing one arm, there is this kind of wobble that happens at the elbow as the weight. It's basically when the weight begins to shift to the outside of the hand. If you bend the elbow, it will stop you losing the balance in that direction and get the weight back centered, basically. So that's kind of for elbow health and questions. The direction the elbow... I, the eye of the elbow or the elbow pit faces is very personal and it generally to do with how much external rotation in the shoulders you like in your handstand. You see a lot of this. You see a lot of people are like completely wrapped around the position. You see people with more open position. Generally, the elbow will go in the position it wants to. A rule of thumb is what I would say is lock out your, set up your hands in your handstand with, do a plank, lock out hard and see where they're facing there. If they're facing there, and that feels okay, that's generally the direction they want to face for you. So, that's it for our questions this week. Uh, as usual, if you have any questions, or you'd like to uh, ask us anything, just DM them to us on Instagram at Hands on Factory, or directly to me or Mikael. Uh, yeah, other than that, next week I suppose we'll have a solo show with Mikael, talking about something awesome as usual. Uh, other than that, I've been Emmett Lewis. We have Albus the Dumble Dog somewhere around. And yeah, have a good week. The Handstand Cast is brought to you by Handstand Factory and is produced by Motion Impulse. Thanks for tuning in. You can find a full transcript of each episode along with the show notes and any relevant references on handstandfactory.com slash podcast. Thanks to Isaac for editing and Jordan for transcriptions. Music by Daniel Horwath. If you want to support the show, you can buy us a coffee on buymeacoffee.com or consider starting one of our Handstand Factory online programs. Links are in the show notes.